Okay, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Upal Mahabub, and I'm serving as the chair of IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to the 10th and final session of the invited seminar series that we organized this year. Uh, uh, we have a, a membership benefit related talk and a technical talk today. So today's talks are was sponsored by the IEEE Young Professionals Affinity Group of uh, San Diego section, IEEE Wichita section, IEEE Las Vegas section, IEEE Computer Society chapter of Las Vegas section, IEEE Computer Society chapter of Foothill section, and IEEE Computer Society of Palu section. Uh, the IEEE Computer Society is dedicated to engaging engineers, scientists, academicians, and industry professionals uh, for global technical advancement in all areas of computing. Uh, this seminar series is an effort to enable knowledge sharing and increase networking among our members as well as interested non-members. And that's why it's like free to register for everyone. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have two segments today. First one is uh, about the benefits of being an IEEE Computer Society member. The second part is a technical talk on AI in healthcare. I'll introduce the speakers before each each talk. So uh, first, let me introduce um, Scott. It's our great pleasure to have Scott Levine, Membership Development Manager of IEEE Computer Society among us to enlighten us uh, about the perks of being an IEEE Computer Society member. Scott has over 10 years of association experience and 18 plus years as a marketer. He worked at Leons and Zucker as a project and media manager and as a marketing manager at Shape America before assuming his current role uh, at IEEE CS. As a manager of membership development at, at IEEE Computer Society, Scott is responsible for designing and executing Computer Society's membership recruitment and retention plans uh, and organize member engagement activities such as the Standards as Activities Board webinar series and the Build Your Career webinar series. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Scott uh, for his talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Opal, and thank you everyone for being here today and welcoming to your your webinar program. Um, as Upal said, I'm Scott Levine. I'm the membership manager here at the IEEE Computer Society. And as Upal said in sort of his his intro to start the webinar, um, the computer society's role is to really help it help the members like empower and shape and guide you know the future of the computing um, community and serve serve and make sort of serve the world and make it a better place so with that in mind i'm going to sort of walk through your sort of cs ieee and your membership um benefits and resources um just some more factoids on the computer society um we've been around for over 75 years and you can see we have um over 375,000 global com community members. We're in 160 countries. We have over 650 chapters, just like um, the San Diego chapter. I think I heard Wichita and Las Vegas were also co-sponsoring this webinar. Um, we have 30 technical communities and um, and these are all to help you throughout all stages of your career. And some notes on IEEE. Um, they're actually, we just got a number updated today. IEEE is actually above 450,000 members. Um, they have over a thousand standards and we'll talk more about CS standards later in the program. And yeah, but this is sort of a lot of what IEEE does when you see like membership or standards, we the computer society is the largest society within IEEE. So oh, there's a lot of parallels with our growth and their growth and whatnot. But going back to the computer society membership, um, there's really two types of benefits and resources. There's your content, 
and then there's um, your involvement. So every member gets a subscription to our flagship magazine computer. They also get a subscription to Computing Edge. Computing Edge will be mailed to you um, if you live in the United States, which I think I'm guessing everyone on this um, webinar does. Um, you get 18 downloads to the Computer Society Digital Library. As a member, you get um, discounts for over 200 um, sponsored conferences events. There's nearly 50 publications you can subscribe to and get a discount on. We have continuing education, and there's also you can get recognized in your work for your the work in your field through our awards program. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You can get involved. Um, we have technical community standards activities. We have online communities like IEEE Collaboratech. We have diversity and inclusion grants. We have emerging tech grants. And you can get um, involved locally and sort of your, work your way up to a regional or global volunteer. A great way to start is with your local chapter. So you can ask Opal if you live in San Diego or um, reach out to the chairs or vice chairs that are on this call, I think from, um, again, Wichita or Las Vegas. And then if there are any students, students get everything you see on this screen. <coughs> Excuse me, the only difference is they get unlimited access to the digital library and there are scholarship opportunities for them. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about the content because that's one of the main benefits. This is computer. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's our flagship magazine, as noted. It's delivered monthly. So um, there's a, you know, publishes the peer-reviewed articles written for and by computer researchers and practitioners representing the full spectrum of computing and information technology from hardware to start software and from emerging research and so on. And it's um, a great magazine, it's award-winning. You can see the few months where the issue has won um, various awards. Um, again, going back to all the content, um, as mentioned, the 49 peer-reviewed publications you can get a discount by subscribing to any of those by being a member of the Computer Society. We publish 41,000 papers annually, and you can download any of these 18, um, any of the 900,000 articles right. through your 18 downloads that you get in the digital library each year with your membership. Um, this is our list of our magazines and journals. There's just 29 here. These are the ones we sponsor um, or sponsor from the that we're responsible for. There's another 20 we co-sponsor that other IEEE societies manage. <laughs> but you would get a discount on those as well. But you can see the big breadth and depth of everything we cover. We have, um, you know, magazines and journals covering big data, cloud, software, emerging topics, mobile, um, multimedia, micro security and privacy, and so on. There's, um, if you've been to any IEEE event or look through our calendar, you know there's the computer side that covers, has a big breadth and depth of coverage of everything that is, um, that falls under computer computer science and engineering. Um, just some notes. Um, we have top magazines and journals. We have 12 of the top side of magazines, top side of magazines in computer science and engineering. The same for our 37 peer reviewed journals. Um, here's just um, some of our magazines that won. Annals has won award in 2022. Security and Privacy won an Apex Award in 2021, and we had a few issues that we won a full year in 2020. Um, and we have great journals that are, we have, that have great 
30 pack factors. Um, T Tammy that you see on the left, that's a 23.6. That's the highest um, our rated publication in all of computer science. It's actually number two in all of the 200 publications that IEEE as a whole puts out. I believe it's only behind Spectrum, which is the IEEE um, flagship magazine. You can see like our effective computing, knowledge and data, services and mobile are some of our highest impact um, magazines. I know about, I'll think close to a third of our publications are some of our the impact factors from some of our top networks here. And this is, as I mentioned, this is also um, part of your membership. It will get mailed out to you um, each month if you live in the United States. And it really curates um, a group of articles that all overlap and relate um, from all of our publications, generally our magazines. So might be a little hard to see on your screen, but you hopefully can see um, on each cover, there's about three to four ticks in a bullet list, those generally all sort of have some overlapping correlations and they're generally pulled from one of our recent magazines. Um, as mentioned, we put on a ton of conferences each year. We do over 200. Um, <laughs> this is a picture from, I believe, SC22 which is um, supercomputing. That's one of our largest, that's actually held in, in, in November, right before Thanksgiving. I think I was actually just at that a week ago or, or like three weeks ago. And I think we had like 15,000 person people there. Um, and we do conferences that are that large scale. And we do conferences that are already like very small and focused that maybe like 120 people show up. And then there's everything in between. Um, Quantum is a big conference we do, Quantum Week in mid September. Um, CVPR, which is has a big AI focus, that's in mid June. Um, and there's a whole bunch of others. If you go to our website, you can go on the calendar. You can easily search by topic. You can search by location if you wanted to stay close to where you were in San Diego. Um, but it's very easy to find what you're looking for. And as I said, we had over 65,000 people attend the conference last year. Um, <coughs> our technical communities are the groups that um, help put on our conferences. And you can see, um, excuse me, our technical community um, areas. And as you can see, just like our um, magazines and journals, there's a wide um, breadth and depth of topics covered. And this is where all of our um, conferences start and originate out of. And you can join these as a member. Um, you can actually join them as a non-member. They're free, but if you want to, it's a good way to get in. This is a good way to get involved. If you're a cloud computing person, reach out to the TC that's on cloud computing um, or, to, or to that conference. Um, <laughs> you are interested in putting on a conference or involved with a conference, we offer um, publishing services. And we do that for over uh, um, 400 conferences. As I other, as I also said, another vital aspect of membership is networking and getting involved. You can see we have 12,000 volunteers across 600 committees, and this is a photo from, I believe, last year's board of one of our board of governors meetings. Another good way is you can get recognized for your work. We have um, nearly 20 um, industry and academia awards that are presented annually. These are for, for 
you know, the best of the best. Um, you know, you can see some of the pictures from our awards. Generally, um, pretty nice plaques. There's some nice monetary um, awards um, or winnings that go to it. Sometimes it's a few thousand dollars. And then there's the um, the general recognition you get for being an award winner. Um, another thing, as probably you all know, IEEE is very well known for its standards. Um, 802, which is your um, LAN and Wi-Fi standards, probably the most well-known or most well-used. Um, um, online gaming is one of our newer standards. I think they're starting to set up a standards group for quantum, um, but you can see all the ones we do. Um, and there's 200 working groups within these. So a working group might be, um, there's, I think it's 802.3 and 802.11, but a working group might be 802.11 AJ or, or DE or whatever um, sort of numerical or alphanumeric working group they're up to. Um, and we also put out some um, white papers or some, something like that. We always do a text trend predictions, which um, this is the slide for the ones for this year, this current year, but our 2024 list will be out shortly. I know um, that's highly anticipated. And again, this is um, some of our networking and industry leader events. Um, our online education, we have as you can see, we have 70 courses across 13 topics. Again, we try to cover all the areas our members are working in. So it's a big um, breadth and depth of coverage that we try to accomplish. And here's three of our certificate programs. Um, there's an associate, a professional, professional master. This is all related to SWEBA, which is our software of engineering software bodies of knowledge software engineering bodies of knowledge and we're actually updating that book and I'm, we're hoping that the update for that book will be out sometime next year um with one new thing we have is we started in a few years ago we started diversity and inclusion grants um our efforts are to empower our community to increase inclusivity throughout computing and we've awarded over 82,000 in DI grants the last two years. Um, I believe the, if you have an idea and want to apply for one, it, the, the grants for 2024 just closed in September, but um, think about your idea, start working on it, start mapping it out because the, um, the window application starts to open in the June, July timeframe and run through September. And you can find the link of all the information you need to put in your application um, and proposal on our website. And then we have um, emerging technology, same thing, looking for, you know, the next brightest ideas. Um, same thing, timing, I think, I guess opens in the spring. And we've awarded over $308,000 um, over the last two years. And these are where you can follow us on social media for all the latest news and ongoing events, call for proposals for certain conferences, open volunteer positions. Um, and anything else we might post on social, social, the social media. And I think that that's it. Any, um, any questions? Before I hand it back over to Opa. Yeah, uh, I had a question. Yeah, this is Sharon here. Um, 
you invite us to connect to you through all these social media, but is there like a, an actual website or email or like several of the awards that you have that we can respond to or see and fill out an application there? Because sometimes we get lost when trying to navigate anything IEEE.org, you know, it's, uh, uh, I think even more challenging than so, the forest. Um, so I can put it in the chat when I X out of this. Um, the Computer Society has its own website of computer.org. Um, so these awards we give out, they are in OPA, I just saw put in the chat. These yeah. are our awards. They're not IEEE awards. So you would apply for all these through, you can find all the criteria to see if you're eligible on our website and then you would apply for them through our website yeah scott i have a question so uh, like uh, maybe can you uh oh i uh, actually uh, before that there is a question in the chat what is the fee for joining the ieee computer society maybe add just that first um so if you're an IEEE member, there's two, there's two price points. If you're an IEEE member, it is $60 to add Computer Society on, onto your IEEE membership. Um, I'm assuming everyone here is in the States. So I believe your IEEE membership is about $220. So your computer society membership would be 60. So if you're looking at both, that's you're about 280. There is the option if you want to just join the computer society on your own um, without joining IEEE. We have about 3000 members who are just computer society members. We, we sort of refer to them as affiliates. Um, you can join just the computer society without IEEE for 141. So it's roughly half of just joining the computer society if you don't want to join IEEE. Generally, an affiliate would join, would only join the computer society if they're very, um, if they're basically just really focused on the CS and CE and the EE benefits they would get to I from I triple don't don't really relate to them anymore. Or the EE focus. Yeah. yeah, thanks. So yeah, the question I have was like I saw like there are uh, some a few like courses and certificate programs. Are those exclusive for CS members or like all the because they are CS has a lot of programs that even non members can get Correct. benefited no, from. Everything in here, the courses, they are, are I forget where they are. Um, I think these, um, the, you can buy these as a non member. There is, uh, it is slightly higher. I don't, don't remember what the, the price point difference is. But you're probably going to pay maybe 15 to 20 percent more by being a non-member. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and uh, how about the CS, uh, um, like co-sponsored conferences? Is there any benefit? Yeah, conferences. If you're a member, you you can get a a discount on your member on on the registration fees. It's generally 15 to 20% off whatever the conference registration fees are. Um, one membership, if, you, if you're a member and you go to one conference, you're probably gonna be ahead. If you're someone who goes to two conferences, you're definitely gonna save money in the long term. I see. Like going the, um, the computer side. One conference, you, you should, you should always be ahead and save money by being a member. Um, mm -hmm. Every conference is different, but you you should you should come out ahead 
by joining in the Anglo State on your conference registration fees. Nice. Uh, there's another question in the chat. Why the CSS fees are so high compared to other IT police societies? <laughs> Professor Aha does that question. <laughs> so he, he, yeah, our next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm not sure what all the other societies. Are, so I uh, if, if you'll allow me, this is Sharon Kalwani. Yeah, I had I the sure. same question many, many years ago. Uh, I will only offer this as a member of IEEE and society. I think uh, the the breadth of publications and uh, all the other services uh, too numerous to mention actually uh, are appropriate for that uh, fee level. Uh, many people think, you know, it's like other, you know, professional society, you get a publication and a few other things, but there's enormous depth in the computer society. So, you know, they do a lot of other things as well. So it seems uh, equitable to me, just my two cents. Yeah. I mean, I can agree to that. I mean, for me, the also like the opportunity to be involved and like uh, in the in this like volunteer to volunteer for it, I can have pretty good networking opportunity. That also is quite a nice up thing for me. And also, uh, like the, the the publications that Computer Society has and the conference I'm sorry. Arrange I'm sorry. that. I don't, I don't think I can. Yeah. Sorry. I was just saying he was sure Sharon came in a little um um choppy, so I don't think I don't think I caught everything he was saying. Oh yeah, yeah. no, he, I mean he he shared his own uh, like thoughts about why he thinks that this is an appropriate fee given the uh, breadth that computer society has and the depth of like uh, organizing like high quality conferences and. Uh, basically, he he was uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, advocating for it. It was yeah. positive. Quick summary. Yeah, it pos was positive. Positive. Yeah. 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 There you go. There's one for you, uh, all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I think. Uh, is there any more question from the audience? Uh, if not, yeah, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Scott again, and we can move to uh, the next part of uh, today's schedule. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, now we move to today's technical talk, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Mohammad Atikur Rahman Ahad, Associate Professor of AI and ML at the Department of Computer Science and Digital Technologies, uh, the University of East London, UK. Uh, Professor Ahad is a prolific researcher. Uh, he's going to talk about AI on healthcare based on video and IoT sensors focusing on human activity and behavior understanding. Uh, Dr. Ahad is a senior member of IEEE and Optica. He received more than 55 hours and recognitions, uh, is identified as one of the top 2% researchers in the world as per Stanford University's uh, 2022 survey. He published uh, 13 books uh, and more are coming. Uh, even I'm collaborating uh, with him on a book. Uh, he has 220 plus peer reviewed papers and book chapters, and he delivered uh, more than 150 keynotes at many different venues around the world. Uh, he serves in the editorial boards of uh, many different journals, uh, served as the general chair of multiple AIML conferences in recent years, most notably uh, the ICIV and IVPR CDs uh, uh, he has been organizing for many years now. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, request Professor Ahad to to uh, like uh, take us uh, to this journey. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, for your nice introduction and uh, all the audience and uh, Scott for your introduction about the Computer Society. I am part of it since long, and I know its importance. But uh, the question is uh, not from me, uh, from many. Uh, participants that why uh, the computer society 
separately charges more than other societies and so on. But uh, I understand, and as uh, we got the answer, that uh, it uh, offers ample of other opportunities and uh, there's a thing. And if you look at the yellow journal, the IT free transactions for me, I, I can recall it. Like, I mean, how high quality, I mean, uh, publication it is and the CVPR, ICCB and this kind of things. Wonderful, wonderful works. So with that note, I thank the organizers, uh, the IEEE Computer Society and San Diego uh, um, uh, chapter for uh, having me. Uh, this is uh, my opportunity to share my some of our works and uh, um, to have some further future collaborations so that we can learn from each other and uh, have mutual benefits to develop the world and the research community. So um, uh, AI in healthcare, we know that this is a very wonderful domain. AI yeah, is everywhere people are talking about, uh, but uh, uh, with the progressions of uh, AI in uh, uh, many different levels, healthcare, uh, um, uh, we have lots of opportunities uh, based on uh, video modalities or various IoT sensors, whether it's on body sensors uh, uh, or, I mean, uh, some kind of smartwatches or mobile phone based or uh, some environmental sensors. So these are the things uh, uh, we explored some of the areas. Uh, I'll try to share some of those things. My name is MD Atikur Rahman Ahad. MD is not for medical doctor, so I can't read your pain. Uh, MD stands for Muhammad. So if you find that MD and not a doctor or not a managing director, so uh, almost 100% he's a male from Bangladesh. Uh, so uh, MD, some people remove my MD thinking that uh, my MD is not needed. They start with Atikur Rahman Ahad. So, but MD is part of my name. So you can call me Atik or Ahad. So uh, I am at this moment at University of East London. I moved to UK last year. So if you are around the UK, just uh, feel free to knock me. I love to meet you and have more discussions. Uh, at the same time, I'm uh, a visiting guest professor of Kyushu Institute of Technology, Japan, uh, visiting professor of uh, UCSI University and uh, uh, another one in Turkey. And uh, this is all about me. So um, I was uh, at Osaka University until last year. I moved uh, to UK. And uh, if you visit, uh, that's fine. And this is my love, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, wonderful, beautiful place and beautiful campus. Welcome to visit my university. I still consider everything, my soul and love are here. And this is, <laughs> I mean, outside this is wonderful. And this is the uh, hill for students called the exam hall. So we have centralized examination systems in the science and engineering faculties. So we organize all exams inside this building. So as long as you are a student, you never like exams. And at this moment, I am at the University of London. So if you can fly to London City Airport uh, from Europe, there are lots of flights. And uh, if you can just swim, swimming and crossing up uh, to UK border is a common thing. So if you can swim, then you can uh, knock my door. This is my uh, room. So welcome to our University of East London. We have several campuses. So th these are two different campuses. It's a global university, local roads, and uh, we are looking for industry and academic collaborations. So today's talk about human uh, action or activity or working pattern uh, to explore those things for different healthcare applications based on vision and IoT sensors. So we know RGB because you can see my uh, RGB images. Uh, from these, we can uh, extract a uh, skeleton data. Uh, so by using special sensors or, uh, I mean, uh, open pose, alpha, alpha pose, the yellow, uh, the recent version eight and so on. So we can get the, or I mean, motion capture system. So we can get the various skeleton body joint points uh, and can consider that the privacy is no more problem, more or less. And uh, also you can explore the depth images. So uh, this is one video side, the vision side. Another one is smartphone uh, or other IoT sensors, which uh, uh, have been, uh, I mean, explored in many, many different applications. Uh, mostly the accelerometer or gyroscope, these kind of sensors from where we can get some data. Nowadays, we are exploring like, I mean, uh, Samsung's or Fitbit's or uh, Garmin's uh, or Ampetica's, uh, different, different, uh, I mean, uh, smartwatches having some sensors uh, that provides different physiological data that we can explore. 
There are many different applications, especially healthcare, but some others, uh, I'll de demonstrate some of those things. Uh, like video surveillance, we are not working that much. Uh, sports video analysis, understanding someone, uh, uh, and especially hospital rehabilitation center, smart houses kind of things. And fall detection, uh, uh, falling down uh, detection at the same time, if we can predict before someone is falling down, uh, this will be very interesting applications and so on. Activity analysis for daily exercise monitoring, remote uh, monitoring outside hospital. We call it remote patient monitoring or remote person monitoring. These are increasing and other as well, like elderly care, dementia or Parkinson's disease cases, remote patient and so on. We know that remote patient monitoring uh, is nothing but an innovative use of some digital technologies and AI to track health status to improve health outcomes. And it's a huge, huge, I mean, uh, 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 prospect and uh, the global uh, remote patient monitoring systems market will be worth over, I mean, 2 billion in the next uh, several years. Uh, so that's uh, huge in different, different cases. So we can explore and uh, we can improve human life. But the problem we will see more or less is the data. So we cannot make a system without a good amount of proven ground truth and trusted data. Uh, and based on this, we can make a system. So people are trying, we are trying, uh, in some, lots of uh, industries are trying, hopefully uh, some smarter and better systems will come that will, uh, I mean, help people. So some examples regarding uh, this one, uh, extremely important area uh, we have been working on. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm new in this field, but uh, this is a highly important uh, area. So that's why I put it at the beginning that antimicrobial resistance, AMR, which is considered as the silent pandemic by the expert. Why is it? Because it's one of the top healthcare problems globally, uh, according to who uh, it's a one big problem. And that's why they, uh, I mean, I have a division called an antimicrobial resistance division because of, I mean, uh, if you are coming from uh, some developing countries, not everywhere, but uh, I mean, many places we know that antibiotics are, I mean, misused, uh, overuse or uh, misuse of antibiotics. So what happens that, I mean, uh, people uh, suffer because uh, bacteria is uh, smarter now. So they become uh, drug resistant and you cannot kill the bacteria, whereas bacteria are killing us. So, I mean, 5 million deaths per year is, I mean, unbelievable amount according to World Health Organization. And it's increasing and it will be much more in the future unless we find uh, strategies uh, to kill the bacteria. And how to know their resistance, how to know the enemy, for example, and their behavior. So we work on human activity uh, uh, where we have lots of data, we have lots of features, but uh, in the bacteria domain, when we go for bright field images or, uh, for example, uh, uh, fluorescent images, we don't get enough features from those bacteria, and uh, to get lots of data, use that classical uh, or advanced uh, machine learning or AI scheme to that domain and to get good results, to understand their behavior, it's not easy. So this is uh, the problem. So the, uh, our goal is to find uh, some strategies uh, based on AI and, uh, and so on. So if anyone is working in that domain, please, uh, later on, contact me because we can discuss uh, and share our challenges and opportunities to work together. Another uh, work we are doing uh, related to healthcare is thermal stress understanding. So think about that. I mean, heat-related deaths have been increasing uh, all over the world. I mean, only uh, last summer, few weeks. I mean, it's uh, uh, as as if uh, a person from Bangladesh. Uh, this heat is not a big deal, uh, but now, still, we notice that more than 56,000 deaths in England and Wales only, according to this report, uh, and it's a government report. So only, uh, I mean, a couple of weeks, summer heat waves. So it means that it is a dangerous problem, and globally it's uh, increasing. And we know that indoor temperature and external air temperature will increase by several degrees uh, within the next uh, 40, 50 years. So that will, I mean, make the 
uh, situation more disastrous. So, and there are lots of elderly people uh, who are staying uh, at home without the proper ventilations or proper, I mean, heating management and other things. So, how to do this kind of thing? So, uh, one strategy is that using, I mean, physiological data and uh, indoor and outdoor environmental information, if we can extract uh, something and predict some dangerous situation before someone, I mean, gets a stroke. So this this is uh, very important. Another point is that when we work, it's not only thermal stress. Like for example, I'm giving a presentation. Say uh, uh, I'm under stress. Some people are under stress. So whole day I work too hard. Say uh, I last one week I didn't have a good sleep. So what will happen? That I have thermal stress. I have work stress. I sometimes may have mental stress. So when we have multiple stress incorporated at the same time, then it will be much more severe. Now, can we understand? So uh, with our collaborators, we are working for that. Uh, in Japan, uh, the data was collected with Ampetica uh, uh, E4 sensor uh, with uh, one company, Fujitsu, and then the data was collected uh, uh, by creating three different I mean, thermal stress situations indoor, and also we collected data ex externally out outdoor for those people who are working in extreme heat situation. And then uh, we are, <clears throat> I mean, trying to understand the relationship uh, of thermal stress and other stress and any possibility to, uh, to predict the danger situation. So it's a very complex work, need a rigorous data sets. So there are not much work, we need to do much more. So. Uh, that's the point. So, <clears throat> I mean, to uh, uh, understand heat and go for heat analysis based on environmental parameters and physiological parameters like heart rate variability, galvanic conductance, and other information, and so on. So, uh, we are working on uh, it's good, uh, but um, much more to do. Actually, uh, recently in Germany, uh, in a challenge, global challenge on, uh, I mean, uh, heat stroke uh, uh, prevention challenge. Uh, our team we won and uh, got the third pr prize as well, so that's a good. Another related work on mental stress or mental health or well-being at the same time productivity prediction related to current situation. You see that I mean because of COVID pandemic, uh, we become used to telework and office work more or less. Many of you are working uh, partially at home, partially at the company, uh, and during that time, I mean many people switch to their work. Uh, to, to uh, from home. Now, what is the point now? I mean, did you study that which one is better for which kind of people? And, um, and these kind of things are very important because we want to ensure the mental well-being and mental health of the staffs when they work at home versus work at office or mixed. And at the same time, this is, uh, I mean, uh, a society where we always think about the productivity. Okay. So, uh, there, there should be a balance, but mental health is important. Now, for that purpose, with, uh, I mean, uh, entity, the, uh, uh, we collected data from a real staff for more, I mean, more than two weeks uh, and 100 people, they uh, gave us, I mean, full data. That data uh, will provide us uh, the physical and mental health, the work productivity and work-like balance and family functioning related information. Uh, to see the positive and negative impacts. It's not easy to find because human psychology is extremely different and difficult to understand. Even for the psychologists, they cannot comprehend someone's problem properly. Now, the goal is that when we work uh, on these kind of problems, we need uh, to understand the relationship between work behaviors and physical and mental health. Now, you see that now I'm talking uh, <clears throat> uh, from my desk. So it's a known environment, but if I talk at uh, from the in the university, even in my room, probably I'll be less relaxed because uh, uh, whether I'm shouting too much or whether somebody will knock me to dis I mean, discuss something because I'm in my room. But when I'm doing at home, only my kids are around, probably they will make noise, but that's fine because I mean, uh, I mean, I requested them and even if they make, this is not a mental stress. So 
some people like to work from home. Some people like to work from, and I mean, office work, uh, I mean, in the office. So these kind of things and relationship and family balance, work balance, sleeping habit and so on. There are many, many things we need to do. We all know by this time that if we work from home, then we need to work more in most of the cases like meetings, even at night, even early in the morning and longer meetings, longer discussions because somebody can call easily and so on. So these kind of things we can understand how. So that's why we need to develop a data set. So multimodal data. So data entry from user using a smartphone. So we need a smart app. And uh, say, for example, this is a smart app and you can have uh, like uh, different different parameters to understand that what kind of works and under which environment uh, you are doing. So this is action type selection screen and there will be more detailed one like uh, like home or living room and other and uh, like outside or workplace and uh, maybe if, uh, in a coffee shop and something. So apart from the sense of data, we also need to get the uh, different data to get the depression and anxiety mood scale and uh, we can get different values and their engagement and productivity and so on. So based on this, we want to know the fatigue level uh, <laughs> and uh, whether someone is tired and uh, they are, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, adjusted or not. And this kind of information, what I say based on this kind of skill, and at the same time, the wearable sensors, the physiological data, what they reflect like my stress level, my sleeping habit, my work activity, this kind of thing. So it's extremely complex without a doubt, as you can understand. And we try to uh, find the relationships and so on. So this is, uh, I mean, under review as well. Regarding remote patient monitoring, uh, another important area, what we are working with uh, NEC and uh, one rehabilitation hospital uh, and the one university in Japan, like patients in rehabilitation. We all know that globally, therapists and doctors are fewer. And especially for uh, serious cases, we don't get enough doctors and enough therapists. Uh, and when uh, any pandemic happens, if you had family members, you know that how much uh, the cost, I mean, and the pain. Uh, so can we have any automatic system to help doctors or therapists? Can we evaluate a subject or patient remotely from home? So with that goal, I mean, uh, if say, for example, uh, when you go to, when you, say I have a stroke, not you, Okay, and uh, uh, and then I have some hemiplegia problem or um, some gait problem. Okay, normal versus abnormal gait. And then when I go to the hospital or clinic, uh, as nurse or I mean therapist or doctor uh, tells me to do something, and they evaluate based on some points. Now these points can be SIAS score, it can be BBS score, it can be another one, another one, another more than 10, 20 different scores for different, different specific purposes by the doctors. Now, if we can say that at home, now I am the patient at home in front of the camera, I do some limited exercises or some actions, okay? And then based on this, I mean, the camera is collecting the data. Now, if we say privacy is a problem, which is genuinely true, and especially if I have problem uh, like healthcare or rehabilitation, I may not be wearing proper clothing every morning uh, when I am in front of the camera. It's not possible sometimes. So on that case, if I use some sensors or, or Kinect sensors or something, video is not collected. From there, I can get the skeleton data and uh, do something so that I can uh, model the human posture and predicts uh, estimate some score which is i mean closer to the doctors now this is wonderful idea people can do it but the what is the first problem the first problem is to get the data now how will you get 100 200 500 1000 patients and they are ground to data at the same time they will provide you the health related information and it should be extracted and then work for that that is the other part so collecting data, especially from serious patients and others, is not easy. And we collected data for more than two years and got only 122 or alike, I mean, patients. And when you collect data afterwards, you find that there are different, different problems and you cannot consider all the data. And many cases, this kind of uh, healthcare data are not open source, not open, uh, open for all. So this is another big, big issue. So with that considerations, we need to work. So just one thing, like, for example, you see that, I mean, SIAS score for each action, 
doctors give zero to five. Zero means dead. I mean, you can do it. And five means normal and vice versa. So many, many different things. And you can see without understanding the whole thing, just assume that from the red means that from the video, we cannot get the information as doctor did. Like sometimes we can see the first one, zero to five, doctor gives that the your ability to raise the hand like this and to go down and go up and so on, do it three times. If I can do it normally, then doctor will give me five points. Say I have stroke this side, unfortunately. Then I try and I do like this way, halfway. So you, doctor will not give me five points, probably give me three points. But when I do like this, but I say, mm, it means that I have lots of pain or I bend my body. Doctor will not give me even three. They will give me two or even one. Now the point is that when we collect the, I mean, video data and do the analysis based on the skeleton or depth image or maybe on body sensors. Can we understand the physical expression? Now, if the video is not recorded or not provided, then no uh, expression, no sound. And sometimes pain, you tolerate, your face has pain information, but you don't have the sound. So for, without facial information, it's very difficult. Somebody can say, okay, go for different wearable sensors to understand the pain. We know that it's not easy, but we are working to find pain. Okay, not emotional pain, not romantic pain, but physical pain. Now the physical pain to get collect from different sensors, this is another problem. Many rehabilitation patients or CS patients will not like to wear any kind of extra sensors attached to the body because that will be harmful or painful in other way. So there are different, different challenges, but we need to work with that. Another action you can say that finger function test, like doctors will touch and, I mean, and check the ticks and ask you some questions, you give some feedback, but it's not possible. And similarly, it's, this is easy, this is easy, but from skeletal data, it's also very difficult, like this kind of foot patting because this is a, sub, a very subtle difference as you can find. And then at the, another point is that, for example, uh, if you use Kinect sensors or any kind of uh, methods, the age points like fingers or, I mean, feet, these kind of uh, cases, the joint points are always noisier than other points, okay? Midway, the points are better, but age points are not good. So what happens that you cannot consider these kind of things as well? So sometimes we need to assume that based on the ability to extension of knee or hip flexion, probably the person has this one good. So instead of considering five points and five points, probably out of 25 points, you need to consider five, five and five, 15. So, and these kind of things, so that there should be much more strategies to uh, find. So the goal is that from videos or skeleton data or depth images or on body some sensors and multimodal, if we can extract some features and estimate some scores, that would be wonderful. But can we get all together? Regarding pain, pain is one information you remember here uh, uh, that pain is considered one of the items. Now, if you have pain and still you can, I mean, raise that body but doctors can ask you, but uh, the camera cannot know or sensor cannot know. So uh, we need facial information probably, or probably some sort of IoT sensors to extract better data. Sometimes can we extract sound? Because if we can extract sound and, uh, you, uh, and understand that this is abnormal sound, then that would be uh, easy as well. But it will vary from culture to culture. Some people are tolerant to, uh, I mean, pain and so on. So, and multimodality issues, I mean, uh, we can explore many, many different things. So the goal is that we want to study the progress of uh, human activity or gait, walking pattern, and try to understand normal versus abnormal. And just not binary decision, just like in the world, we are not a good guy and a bad guy. We are fuzzy people, like uh, especially if you uh, have a good family, then uh, your spouse will sometimes say that you are the sweetest person and sometimes maybe uh, something at the bottom level, but most of the cases may be average or upper level, okay? So it means that quality. So instead of giving binary one or zero, we get in between some values. If we can 
understand human activity and behavior based on scoring mechanism for a, a longer period uh, to evaluate their activity, not just typical action recognition or classification, rather than action quality, that would be excellent for healthcare perspective. And that will help us remote patient monitoring perspective or hospital or care at home without visiting therapists frequently. And the concern is that RGB, we have privacy issue. Can you solve it? One strategy is that you make sure that your system will take the video, extract the related information, including facial points and others, so that you can use them uh, to understand. Do not save any RGB. That would probably save some of the cases. Skeleton based, but we have less and weak data and um, edge points are no noisier. Can we get something better? Sensors, any patient discomfort, especially when they sleep or sit down. So we need to make sure what kind of sensors will be more appropriate. Or maybe if I say now at this moment for the last, I um, mean, um, uh, uh, two months, I am having some frozen shoulder, shoulder pain. Severely, you may notice that sometimes I touch and do it because I'm having pain. Now, when I have pain, I don't like to put any sensor here, but maybe other side is okay. You can put sensors and see that at least uh, another information can give uh, something better or loosely bound some sensors because when you go to the hospital, we always use some kind of band. Okay, uh, so that band uh, for the uh, patient identification band. Uh, similar kind of loosely bound sensors can be, uh, I mean, used uh, to explore some healthcare applications. It's extremely difficult because many cases the progresses are very slow, minute differences from one week to another because it always takes time to get better. Uh, but great scope to work, uh, and not only the rehabilitation but related related other problems. Now the point is that how to engrave emotion as the images privacy issue. How to, I mean, incorporate pain. Uh, this is a problem, and especially psychology uh, variations in psychology. I mean, with sensors and cameras versus human, and so on. So now, uh, in another work, uh, we uh, have been exploring the depth data or skeleton data for normal person and say someone. Uh, stroke or Parkinson's disease or whatever. Now you see the exercise. Now, if I do the exercise as a normal person, maybe I do like this, but as I have pain, probably I cannot do the thing properly. How far I am from the normal person's activity and how much deviations I have and which areas, if we can extract those things, that would be wonderful. And we notice that it is possible to extract. Now, back to the sensor base again, uh, that uh, we recently, I mean, uh, in uh, Parkinson's disease, wearing of recognition challenge uh, uh, by one university from Japan. In that competition, uh, we become second position. We got the second and uh, not the first one, unfortunately. But that is extremely important, and we have been working on that project, like Parkinson's patients wearing of periods. So if you have any family members who have Parkinson's disease, you might have noticed that they take some kind of medicine and the medicine will stop the vibration or, uh, I mean, uh, problem. So uh, the Parkinson's disease if a pause and then after seven hours or eight hours, you need to take the medicine. But what happens with time, the impact of the medicines are gone. So anti Parkinson's disease medications, it re-emerged the of symptoms prior to the next medicine intake. That is called wearing off problem. Off means, I mean, the medicine is not working anymore. Then what we need to do, we want to know that part. If we want to, we, if we can know that uh, before, I, so it's normally family members, or I know that after six hours, I need to make medicine, but four hours gone and I started, uh, I mean, vibrating or uh, trembling like this way, or walking pattern problem, or I feel weaker or something problem, then this is an issue. Now, most of the cases, dementia patients uh, cannot recall when to take the medicine. Sometimes we need family members to support. Now, what will happen that if we can know 
based on say I have uh, these sensors. Actually, uh, we are using exactly this Garmin uh, one. So, uh, so Garmin smartphone, it has some sensors. It will collect data, physiological data and other data. And then based on this, we can uh, get the information and we want to determine the next occurrence of widening off uh, and so that we can find some solution. So that's the point that winding up periods data set is developed and uh, to, to get the drug intake information and based on this, uh, if we can do it, we can help Parkinson patients, PD patients, and uh, hopefully it will be good. It's not easy again, because uh, as I mentioned that uh, we need data set from the real patients and real patients longer period data set for, I mean, for many patients, it, it is not easy. And we know that, I mean, uh, normal activities like walking, running, jogging, these kind of things are pretty similar, more or less, okay? Unless you're Usain Bolt, then your running is different. But a PD patient, if we consider 1,000 PD patients and their activities, if you uh, don't go to the hospital, just Google it and get, I mean, uh, uh, learn from 100 different videos and you see that the patients, their movements, their stabilities and their, I mean, gait, walking pattern, all are different and uh, it's not easy. If you work with hospitals, you know that, I mean, how difficult life is and we feel great that we're still at home and healthy and so on. So, uh, this is one. Another important area we are working on remote monitoring uh, related to autism therapy. So, autism uh, is a, gl a global problem because there are more autistic children than the past, people say, but at the same time, uh, being from Bangladesh, a developing country uh, where autism is uh, highly ignored, many countries, developing countries, autism is uh, considered uh, something stigma or even mental disease, and there are very few hospitals uh, to support them, let alone schools for their education and social awareness. Now it's much better, but when I I grew my life, like uh, my teenage and others, I, uh, I never knew that autism uh, is what I know now. Now what happened that if you have autistic children at home or family members, you know that there's a diverse, we cannot solve everything, but say that conditions are not so serious, they go to the school, they do different kinds of therapy sessions. And so, for example, imitations like, hello, how are you? So the child is doing the same and joint attention, like you are talking, I'm talking, communicating and turn taking or some other games they do based on their performances. I mean, a therapist, physical therapist, she or he can support and give some scores. So in these data set, having 60 plus children, uh, uh, the age range is, uh, as I recall, 3.5 to six years old, and half of them are robot enhanced therapy and half of them are human standard therapy to predict autism score. So in this case, we consider uh, the ADOS score, autism diagnostic observation schedule score. Now we'll see how it works. Now you see that this is the child. This is me, for example, an autistic child playing in front of a robot, but there is a uh, therapist, for example. The therapist is here and the child is interacting with a human being and therapist is evaluating their interactions and give some score. Instead of human being, if there is a small robot, and which is more logical in some cases, you can replace the robot with a screen, like with a cartoon video and animation and so on, okay, that will be interactive with the child. And based on doing that interaction, if there are some sensors, in this case, Kinect sensor, for example, which is obsolete now, but you can use other video cameras and go for the skeleton data. So basically you are getting upper body skeleton data, eye direction and head gaze movement. Oh, I have pain. I cannot do too much. Okay. And based on those information and some other, I mean, actions, how long they do, it takes to do and so on. If we can make and understand uh, their, I mean, uh, ADOS score, which is the goal to predict their score with time to time, that would be one important uh, work. It's extremely difficult with, the child, I mean, data from 60 kids, it's not possible to uh, furnish anything, uh, I mean, cohesive, but we need to work more. And again, uh, recently we applied for uh, you uh, big fund uh, with 10 different partners globally, uh, but uh, I'm not sure whether we can get it. I, I hope that they will give us so that we can start a big data set and try to do something more and if anybody is interested,
to provide data or have some uh, school and collaborations and so on, I'll be delighted because this is one of my areas I want to explore further and detail. Thank you. So recently, now, now we also developed a new data set uh, for autistic children. But at this moment, this is the largest data set, as we understand. Uh, the previous one, uh, not enough I mean, images. This is a problem because we can have lots of typically developed children's data set, but when it comes to autistic children uh, or uh, children having ASD, uh, it's very difficult to get data set. Uh, so this is a problem. So then we developed two methods uh, and uh, our result is good, but this is not the goal. The goal is to make a larger, stronger data set that will reflect uh, the true presentation of human being as well as I mean, uh, uh, applicable to work so that we can get better one. Now, somebody can ask that why face is needed? Because only from face autism is extremely difficult. Do you know? Yes, we know that it is not possible to understand only from face uh, uh, confidently. But think about the corona time. During the COVID period, what we did, we just take the thermometer and then if we find that my temperature is high, even though I didn't have COVID, I was passed somewhere or entered somewhere and something like this. So temperature was the initial point. If I had COVID, but still the temperature is low, I was supposed to go. So it happened in many, many cases. Now, similarly, like if we have face, face based, so I want to enter a, a small child, six, seven, or so four, three, four, five years old, I want to go to the kindergarten and others or others elsewhere or in hospital, many cases in many parts of the world, we don't care. We consider that the child is behaving probably a bit different, but it's normal because many ch children, uh, they behave many different ways and uh, uh, whatever they do, we become happy. It's very difficult to understand. And many cases, we do not understand the early stage of ASD and we cannot support the kids uh, so that they can be better. So the goal is that if only from the facial image, like we want to go to a school or a kindergarten or shopping center or somewhere, and there is a small cameras collecting, and then if they have there is an automated system which is profoundly driven by good data set, and then it can predict that probably I have ASD or related things. Parents or school teachers or guardians can consider this and check further to see whether there is something or not with a related professional. So that is the goal, but only from face is not easy and not justifiable uh, globally. Regarding healthcare, another important area we have been working for the last several years uh, called NARS Care Activity Recognition Challenge. Uh, when we started this, uh, there is a challenge uh, again from Japan, but it was a part of ACM Ubicom, Ubiquitous Computing is one of the best conferences in the world and the, the next one and also with the fourth international conference on activity and behavior computing, ABC. Okay, uh, by the way, the sixth ABC will be held in Japan. So if you are working on activity, behavior, uh, mental health, well-being, video based activity or sensor based activity uh, or behavior, please, please. Uh, to, uh, consider uh, this conference and submit papers. It will be held in Japan, but also a hybrid. Uh, we are developing a good forum uh, for that purpose. So that is the marketing part, but or publicity part. But apart from that, uh, I'm saying that this NARS activity recognition challenge has been going on, and our team participated, uh, um, uh, different teams, and we have very good results we own a couple of times. But the goal of the data set is to understand that nurses, they do many different activities. Can we understand they are be, I have different activities and see that which kind of activities they do more frequently, but we can replace with some automations or who is doing more and who is doing less or uh, and so on. In this case, we did not consider the mental stress which is important by the way to, to consider. So this data set is not collected by us, but uh, the uh, partners and then we uh, worked on those now uh, and in Japan. Now, what are we learned from here? This is I want to share that real life data is difficult just like our real life. Okay, life is not always romantic. So you can see that huge class immense problem. Now see, this is NARS A, NARS number eight, okay? 
see he or she has been doing some of the activities much more but many of the activities very little and nurse number 13 does some of the activities more but others much less and you see that most of the activities for 49 days they have much less information so when you have a huge class imbalance problem and lots of missing data as well and some cases very short duration of some activities and another major problem is human error that nurse their main responsibility is to serve the patient because we collected and the data was collected in the hospital real field now they can forget to stop recording an activity even if it is finished okay now data i mean when they do something they use the mobile app to entry now they should have some connectivity and the ground route and so on these kind of genuine problems are there and uh, it's not easy by the way so it's a very complex one and we have, uh, I mean, good amount of publications as well as, uh, I mean, awards. So uh, uh, we become second twice uh, champion or a, a winner once and uh, third in uh, uh, once. But last year, the last, uh, I mean, competition, we got nothing. This is also real life that you cannot win always. Uh, this is another word, uh, again, <clears throat> the, um, I mean, extremely difficult we feel. Uh, to monitor wellness or risk level uh, of running condition. Now you see that I have pain here, right? Now, if I become a little bit better, or I had a stroke or accident, and then I go to the treadmill to start jogging or <clears throat> running, then what will happen that I might have some more problems. I'm not sure any, uh, I mean, treadmill companies already incorporated these kind of things, but uh, with the hospital and the big company uh, on treadmill, uh, we started this work with high speed cameras and the different different sensors to see uh, that whether we can understand the risk level and the balance of a person when they are doing something on the treadmill. So um, the uh, result was not good. Uh, much need, we need to do much more at this moment. Uh, we stop this project, but uh, I'm interested if we get partner to work on that. Elderly person monitoring system. This is another one uh, uh, to understand uh, and to develop, design, set up, and demonstrate with multimodal cases. Uh, so initially at Osaka University, we have developed a good amount of pilot design and installed in-house patients. Uh, uh, across uh, uh, Japan to collect data. Initially, uh, the RGB or depth cameras was forbidden because they said that privacy issues, but the, when we tried different, different things, we noticed that, I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if we cannot save, uh, don't save it and ensure the privacy issue of those things, then we can go for data collection, but definitely we need much more collaborations and so on. Uh, now, with Nokia Bell Labs, we started this work and uh, we have two works uh, uh, related to wearables. Now, you see that we all use what you call it like uh, Bluetooth devices. But the Bluetooth devices, if we incorporate any IMU sensors, then it can, or other sensors as well. So, uh, in this case, the eSense device from Nokia Bell, uh, uh, it has the IMU sensors. So, when you put the IMU sensors, and then we developed our own, uh, I mean, apps to collect the data, different activities, and go for, I mean, machine learning approaches. The concepts are, are, are very simple, but uh, the tasks are very, really difficult to understand because, I mean, the differences between two, uh, I mean, sets of IMU sensors uh, doing some activities uh, is not easy. Yes, I mean, if we do normal activities, these are okay, but what about eating habit to understand swallowing problem or socialization through speaking communication have when someone has a B due to accidents or by bone, some, I mean, uh, speaking disorder problem. Can we understand that and see the differences? Uh, there, the eSense device has been used by some others, and like uh, National University of Singapore, if I'm not wrong, and some others for different exercises and others. But all those activities were, were so far, by, um, by my understanding, uh, after evaluation, are not uh, on. Uh, I should say, uh, I paraphrase it like in a better way, that not high quality work. So this is. Uh, Another one uh, I want to mention, including our work, because uh, if we do regular activities, then it's not important. 
we need to consider this kind of arable devices to extract much more sensible and difficult activities which are cannot be understood by using uh, i mean other smartwatch or other sensors uh, so here we can have uh, uh, huge uh, opportunities we, we have and uh, i have some ideas as well based on our works so if someone is very much interested to collaborate uh, with industry or something we can uh, hopefully discuss and another important point that can we incorporate the emotional aspects and stress level based on this kind of arable sensors? Say I'm talking about, uh, uh, I'm talking here using, and many people, I mean, if you look at the train on when they walk, they have something here, here. Okay, we are using Bluetooth devices a lot. Now, can we use those things to understand human emotions and stress? That could be interesting work. So regarding uh, gait or walking pattern, we also propose something. It ha also has some healthcare applications and so on. One important area is occlusions. Like most of the cases, our data sets in biometrics or gate recognition are uh, when there is no occlusion. And then we developed our method uh, based on occlusions. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, genetic AI based method so that uh, when there is occlusion still, we can try to reconstruct the gate and then recognize for different different applications uh, now this in this work sensor-based gate to estimate age and gender uh, it can be incorporated to some healthcare applications as well but uh, need much more data to collect so here uh, now we used multi-modal like eight I mean, seven different kinds of sensors to understand different kinds of transportation data like instead of human activity and movement can we understand what kind of modes people are using? So normally, uh, I mean, these kind of sensors uh, can be uh, useful, including the radio receptions like GPS reception, GPS location, radio data, and so on. Uh, I mean, we have one work which uh, at this moment paused. Uh, uh, we developed a system for completely blind people. I am very much interested to continue this work, but definitely I need uh, funding for that purpose as well as some uh, exciting uh, students <laughs> who can uh, work on hardware as well. Because uh, back home when we work, we develop an integrated reading assistant uh, as well as uh, mm, uh, some auditory feedback combining existing methods. And the work is not novel because there are different different systems we incorporated and made a system for blind, but it's still it is published in IT transactions because they consider it a, as a good one. And sign language uh, using data globe design. So normally sign language is like you see my video uh, and then based on the video information, the sign languages are extracted. In our case, uh, this is, I mean, uh, we developed a, a cost effective data globe using flex sensors, IMUs and microcontroller so that I mean, uh, using sensor, some kind of sign language can be extracted. So this is a very interesting work uh, we have been, uh, we have done, but uh, much more to do to pro progress it and so on. This is another work on sign language. But finally, uh, uh, I would like to mention that uh, one very important area is that when we do annotations in machine learning, data collection, and so on. Among the annotators, we have uncertainty, uh, so um, that's a big problem. Can we understand and incorporate the or estimate the um, uncertainty of annotators and uh, manage those things and uh, make the system better? Uh, so in this work, we try to do that uh, uh, with our methods, uh, with different uh, data sets to develop based on the gate data sets. Uh, at Osaka University, and uh, uh, this is a very, very uh, unique and interesting work. If some, it will have much more applications in the future if somebody considers. So, in this noble work, we try to uh, uh, develop a method uh, that is uh, incorporating the annotators' uncertainty and use those things uh, to improve the method and so on. So, uh, within my 50 minutes' time, uh, I'd like to conclude that action or activity based on RGB or skeleton or depth or sensors, there can have multimodal issues. 
and most important applications I feel apart from the security security army and others they are developing a lot and there are lots of progress but healthcare facilities and applications there should be much much more work need data sets and we just don't need to go for the recognition classification we are very good so far uh, in many cases in human activity and behavior based on sensors or RGB and so on. But prediction, predicting the future that whether I'll fall down or not, or evaluating like quality of action or scoring, these are very, very important. And what about uh, emotion and psychology and diversity, mental well-being, which are extremely important to understand. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, you all uh, for your time. I'm looking for industry uh, and academic collaborations. Uh, now, so I love to discuss with more because I have lots of ideas and I've been working, but uh, if we have bigger partners uh, globally, then we can genuinely uh, do more and learn from each other. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, please uh, fly uh, for, to uh, this conference, uh, sixth uh, international conference on activity and behavior computing. Uh, my paper will be in IEEE as per the agreement so far and then uh, uh, we are also going for a journal, uh, developing our own journal for activity and behavior computing. It will be held in May. Please, uh, if you have a QR code, I mean, option, then go for it or later on share or uh, just uh, submit papers uh, here and be part of it. It will be happy as well. And I'm grateful to all of my researchers and students and collaborators. They are the, I mean, uh, Peters and all of my partners so far who helped me throughout this journey. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Ahad. Uh, so, uh, we'd like to open the floor for question answering. If uh, uh, is there any question from the audience, feel free to unmute and ask. I, I do have one question. So, have you considered using like a virtual or augmented reality headsets because those are Packed with sensors. Uh, uh, that, that's a very, very interesting uh, point. Uh, the answer is uh, so far we didn't. Um, uh, one of my um, uh, partners uh, in Japan, like where I'm a guest professor at QTEC, uh, they are using uh, some of in some of the projects, and uh, uh, so far we did not publish anything. So. Mm, uh, this is one. Another project uh, with my friend and uh, where I am a Tubita uh, uh, fellow uh, and visiting professor at uh, Bachissa University in Turkey. Uh, mm, so uh, with uh, Professor Baharul. So they are using AR devices for narrow vision. Uh, so when I visited last uh, August, I think, or yeah, July mm, in Turkey. So uh, we. Uh, uh, just to work with that, but uh, uh, my own projects, my collaborators with them, I'm trying to do something, but my own projects, uh, that's why I didn't present anything AR or VR. Uh, basically, my main focus is not um, AR, VR so far. I'm uh, exploring that any on-body sensors or if any uh, cameras uh, or Kinect sensors now, no, no need for Kinect sensor, like any cameras, uh, on the screen or in uh, any corner, and that can collect some uh, data that would be, um, uh, I mean, explored and see what could be done. And regarding healthcare, uh, uh, it's also, I noticed that uh, important because uh, uh, when uh, at that lab, I tried uh, one VR set to my uh, sons, uh, my, uh, my son Umar, so he tried to wear it, had to see and uh, we see that this one, and all if someone has health problem, on body pain, and others, then probably, uh, uh, I mean, this kind of uh, devices will not be suitable. Uh, in my university, in the psychology department, uh, where I have collaborations with uh, professors, and we are working on that as well. So uh, they have a huge setup on AR VR based uh, system, but that is to understand psychological evaluations uh, and so on. But uh, my core works we did not uh, still explore that much. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's understandable. It sounds like you are more into like a surveillance kind of uh, setup than uh, egocentric. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also maybe another question like, um, how do you plan to deploy this 
things. What it what does it take? Because this are like a lot of research works on many different very interesting topics. But what does it take to actually take it uh, and implement it for real world use cases? Yeah, uh, this is very interesting. So uh, question indeed and uh, very useful because I as I mentioned that uh, when we collect data with the real hospital patients or real data or uh, I mean, care home center. We noticed that I mean, for one year, two years with pure collaboration, still we cannot get more than 100 or 150 uh, subjects data. So this is a major problem. So and uh, 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 as we know, you know, you are working in the industry, so you know much more. But when we go for a product, we need to have much more data for a longer period of time and uh, more trusted information and so on. So uh, any of our works, if we want to uh, implement those things in a massive scale, uh, I must need, we must need much more data and then uh, try uh, to improve the methods as much as possible because healthcare data are extremely diverse, like those who have back pains, and when you share your information that, oh, I have back pain, and then what happens that uh, maybe in your life you find that hundreds of friends, they say that they have different kinds of back pain experiences. And all are, you'll find that there are 100 different ways of back pain, uh, which is extremely difficult. So um, then to find it, I mean, a method that will cover most of them, it's not easy unless we have diverse data. So my point is that say, if we go for Parkinson's disease work or heat stroke work, then 20, 30, 40 subjects to me will not be uh, enough to judge. Uh, and at the same time, most of the cases we collect data only for one hour or maybe half an hour or for, for a moment, but not continuous data. So it might happen that last night I didn't have any sleep and this morning I gave the data, it will be different. So that's the point. We have a question I noticed. So, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a question on the chat. What are the potential foundation models available to obtain additional data uh, to then tune algorithms? Um, uh, can you repeat the question again? Because uh, so um, like potential foundation models available. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, what are the potential foundation models available to obtain additional data to then tune algorithm? Okay, uh, if I understand the question uh, properly, like uh, for uh, to obtain additional data, so do you mean like uh, generative AI based, uh, like GAN based, or others? Now, uh, hmm, I don't know much. If you have anything, you can share with me, but. Uh, uh, for example, uh, available from Google, etc. Uh, mm, okay, mm, yeah. So uh, I think that uh, mm, normally, uh, so uh, just I give one example. Like one of my PhD students, she is working on uh, antimicrobial resistance, the bacteria images. Now the bacteria images uh, mm, uh, we have, but we don't. We need much more data uh, to do it. Now, when we try generative uh, models like GAN or, I mean, uh, GAN's variants, because we used in other models as well, we are struggling to generate bacteria images because when we extract individual bacteria images, we see that nothing because the background and the foreground, there is almost no features available that can be reproduced. So we are struggling. Uh, this is a major issue. Uh, so similarly, healthcare data, like if we come, we need to do with it. First of all, uh, uh, we need to do like, as you mentioned that LLMs or uh, visual models available from Amazon IBM. We did not try that much uh, because what we feel that the uh, sensor data or the video data or skeleton data, what we get from the subjects, uh, um, these are not uh, enough and diverse as well. Now, if we use those things to generate more data, uh, we are not sure that we'll get uh, good data that could be explored, but we are trying a little bit. Uh, for example, in another work, we are trying generative AI based 
data augmentation based on partial data and to see that say partial data is available like uh, one part of the body from that the, uh, I mean data can we extract the enter or predict the entire body data with some information and so on it's not easy and uh, another point is that whether it can be trustable uh, um, this is number two number three is that for uh, I mean healthcare models we must need the relative ground truths for each and every case if we do not have the ground truth like for example the stroke patients case we have for every actions every patients doctor the physicians gave the score that out of 75 what is the score of the patients and each individual actions as well so if you recall the uh, for example oh we did not try any genome or stem biological work uh, till now everything is uh, non genome or uh, not stem based so if you look at this uh, um, score now here uh, yeah this one now if you look at here that in this slide we have so many different actions and if i remove the chat then what you see that i mean for every different actions like seven different types and it has subsections all of them from zero to five or zero to three this way doctors give scores and we need to get not the overall individual as well like doctors know that my score is poor for example overall but some sectors my score is good some sectors my score is extremely poor like say my ability to raise the hand is extremely poor but probably my legs all are okay but overall my score is poor now we consider some students in the school or university which is not good or the student uh, got uh, poor result or average result probably not probably the student got poor result in some of the subjects or modules but in some of the areas, the student is excellent. So doctors also judge like this way. So when you go for generative data and no ground truth, like getting the proper score, corresponding score or corresponding evaluations, that would be very difficult to justify to the doctors or physicians or even the patients and so on. But again, to improve the results, we are thinking, as you said, we are thinking and uh, in few areas we are trying a little bit considering uh, i mean a large language model based as well as of course gan is there for more than 9 years and uh, we have been exploring gan and its uh, variants uh, children and so on mm -hmm. and we already developed some of the gan based variants for uh, different different perspectives and published papers but we need to do more especially in healthcare data is very much challenging and uh, not much have been done or we need to do much more. Thank you for your okay. wonderful points and other points you mentioned uh, we'll check in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ahad. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, we don't, we are running a bit out of time. So I'll just uh, go to the last very small segment of the talk. Again, I want to thank Professor Ahad for the wonderful talk and he covered uh, quite a bit of like, uh, like uh, of his own work and also touched upon a lot of uh, many different uh, uh, challenges in the in healthcare uh, and applying AI in healthcare. Uh, we have this last portion because this is the last talk of our uh, invited seminar series. So I'd like to uh, the, so, so this is basically the closing event. So I'd like to uh, take a few minutes to give an update about our like uh, like the activities uh, that computer society did and some announcement so uh, announcement wise uh, we are actively looking for uh, volunteers like vice chairs for next year uh, and um, so if anyone is interested to uh, like actively work with the computer society uh, and next year we are planning many excellent exciting events uh, so please uh, contact me or charlie charlie is, is uh, one of our current vice chairs and he's present in this meeting uh, to, uh, and let us know your interest and we'll be happy to like uh, um, like collaborate and uh, 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 and uh, like um, include you in our like technical discussions about this uh, organizational things. Uh, we are also looking for a webmaster uh, to to 
kind of update our website regularly and also help us promote these sort of events on social media. Uh, and this year, uh, we this is the 10th talk of our invited seminar series and next year we plan to start a new series. Uh, and uh, this year, all the talks were virtual. Next year, hopefully, we'll also be able to host some in person events in San Diego. Uh, and we also, uh, apart from these 10 talks, uh, we also co hosted more than five events. A few of them were in person. We co, we co hosted with uh, IEEE San Diego section, uh, the Orange County section, and Comsoc, uh, and, and like some other um, affinity groups and sections uh, of IEEE. And uh, and also we uh, i mean we uh, we had a very like a, a set of like co-hosts for each of our events and uh, like uh, for this event uh, as i mentioned earlier the IEEE Wichita section Las Vegas section and pa Palu section Foothill section computer society they are all like part of this event as always we'll upload the, the video to our youtube channel uh, so that for for later viewing uh, i've already received like many interest many people could not attend just because of the time professor ahad it's late in the night in the uk and <laughs> he is attending from there uh, and finally, I'd hand over to uh, our current vice president, uh, vice chair charlie to um, to say a few things, and uh, we also invited as our some of our previous co-hosts, and uh, Charlie shared one of the messages from 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 them. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, congratulations, Bob, on, on the last of a fabulous year, a great year for our members. Uh, be, I had the previous record for holding meetings, and it was six. It doesn't compare to year 11. Very good. And your the quality <laughs> of these meetings is outstanding. It's yeah, wonderful. Thanks. And it's free. It's free for members. Um, anyway, sir, um, we have a note here from, um, this is from the Young Professional Society. And they were thoroughly impressed with the seminar series that the Computer Society has organized. And they've consistently brought value, not only to the Computer Society, members, but also the young professionals by engaging with us talks from renowned speakers on very relevant topics and very current topics. But they're, they are particularly enjoyed and learned from talks on chat GPT and AI. And they thank us for letting them co-host some of these meetings to keep, keep their own members up to date. And they look forward to hopefully doing the same in 2023. So, and again, if, if anybody's interested in doing any kind of uh, work would help us do the meetings, which is um, um, basically for selection committee, also people doing advertising, blah, 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 and people supporting the meeting itself um, it, by greeting members and so on. And we also have a lot of giveaways for when we have um, in person meetings, please see me or Rupal. And thanks again, Rupal, for a fabulous, the best year in the history of the Computer Society. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for the kind words, Charlie. You have been fabulous as well. Uh, thanks, everyone. So that with that, we'd like to close this uh, like seminar series as well as this meeting. Uh, thanks for joining. Yeah, I, I'll share the much, yeah. later. Yeah, thank you, Professor Ahad. It was really nice seeing you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.